what we need to do is figure out how to get stuff out of these bloody bins that are the enemy of recycling no matter what colour they are and into a form where they go back bottle to bottle, drum to drum to the same order or higher of recovery. And to do that, ironically, we didn't devote some new funky circular economy uh, idea because it's the latest buzzword. We actually went closing the loop is what grandma used to do. It's back to the future. Um, and that was when the recycling industry first started, there was a company called Busy. Now, Busy were first started and still has it the we make it sort of take it uh, point, but is largely the first global uh, manufacturing business that has a closed loop. There's a whole lot of reasons you might like Busy, but in terms of them doing that, there is no one better in the world. And it started because a guy with no money decided he was going to run around with a truck and pick up waste paper so that he could get a raw material for his box. He's never changed from there because that's where he started. Is that he was in the recycling business to have a lower cost and in fact a lower greenhouse footprint by sourcing that material from the stuff no one else valued. So what does that mean that we're purpose does? Well, at the simplest level, and what we would do for YHA and things like that, is we'll go and pick you up bundles up that 10 cents you get for a refund that a commercial venue just can't even vaguely access. We started doing it by Dean jumping on his pushy with the most outrageous number of bottles and cans hanging off the back of the bloody thing, driving into a depot that Anthony and I had set up to get rid of the stuff. The return and earn scheme was built and not a single facility or service was set up to service the hotel sector. So why does business oppose it? Because government idiots like me in the Green Movement go, we've got to put a, case, uh, put a price signal on this stuff. With the naive hope that the bureaucrats are smart enough to go, oh, well, we better actually have a collection system rather than just a dog up system. Uh, and then build a whole bunch of rules that become impediments for that. So, we take this, and, and I'm horrified uh, uh, that we're still running wheelie bins at FYHA, but there's a bloody good reason that we are running wheelie bins, which is the most outrageously small um, and height-restricted facility of where their bin room is. But <laughs> we start that by saying we've got to get rid of this stuff. And what we need to make sure is what's in this thing is not a whole bunch of different types of crap. So the first thing that we do is we look at what the value of the waste in a facility is. One, that the waste industry is sending you a whole bunch of these because it's a trick. It's 240 litres or, and, and 100 kilos of waste that you pay for. Typically full, it weighs about six kilos but it's a whole bunch of cubed. So they get a business where they run around and pick up oxygen. And if you pick up oxygen, the cost of running your truck is big. Um, the second thing that they do is because they mixed all of this stuff in there, they then go through a very intensive, very greenhouse polluting process to separate all that stuff called a MRF. When a MRF was first commercialised and brought into reality in Australia, it was a conveyor belt with four splits in four places along that belt. It meant glass over there, plastic over there, paper over there. The modern MRF today is somewhere between 32 and 64 splits to build the facility that will sort the quick crap that comes out of this bin is $180 million capital investment. And as a result, we go around and around and around in not circles. So we value that material, and then we work out where we're going to get. What does that actually do? So I'll give you an example of Royal Randwick Shopping Centre, hardly a massive shopping centre, you know, regional shopping centre. Wandered in there and said, we'd like to talk about source separating your material. And the first thing we saw was their milk bottles. And they had 6,500 cubic metres of milk bottles a week going out of the facility, costing $2,200 to get rid of, and that they were receiving about 100 bucks worth of scrap income because they were just putting it into mixed plastic. The entire focus on what comes out of the bin is 
how to quickly and fast get rid of it without having to pay a waste levy. So we pulled that out. Now the first thing we discovered is if we actually move the point of collective separation up into the cafe, looking at you, um, up into the cafe, that we could compact that here and turn six and a half thousand cubic metres into one of them a week. That's how much they were useful. The second thing, which we didn't actually know at the time, was instead of actually having to pay $150 a tonne to get rid of what was in there, we get paid $500 a tonne. And the result of that is in our 80 odd partners, I can't call them customers, in our 80 odd partners, there were two, I lie, three, where every month when we do our invoicing, we bill them something. We charge them. According to the ATO, the other 77 of them are not my customer, they're my supplier, because we give them a check every month. Just from that simple change of let's work out how to pull that stuff out while it's in your hand, not huge, difficult process, just while it's in your hand, move it, make it small, get rid of paying for the oxygen, and then put it to the highest possible denominator. The result of that is that we're locked in a process where our customers need to be in profit for us to make a buck. If we go to Dean's facility or Gemma's facility to pick stuff up and there's not, and there's not enough material to give them a refund, they lose and we're, and we're broke. Uh, if there was plenty of that stuff, they gain and we're making a shit ton of money, to put it bluntly. And that's what a microeconomic model should actually do, is it should drive mutual outcome.